So without much ado, because Bob is here and has wonderful things to tell us, uh, I've known Bob now for, actually since I thought of this idea, you were one of the first people, 15 years. I called you up and told you about this idea and you thought it was great. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been a great idea. So, um, uh, Shanta has a few things to say. I would like to introduce, we have uh, two speakers with us. We have Bob Wellington, the Senior Vice President for Economics, Communications, and Legislative Affairs at AgriMark Dairy Cooperative, and Gabriel Cole, Gabriel Cole founder of FAIR Resources. Um, so they're going to be talking to you about all sorts of things and intersecting between mission, partnerships, and some of the things that people may or may not forget during their entrepreneurial journey. So we're first going to start with Bob, and then Gabriel is going to join us, and I'll turn it over. Okay, I appreciate, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I do work for Agrimark Dairy Co-op. Uh, we're a co-op of about a, 1,100 dairy farms in New England and New York. Uh, it sounds like a lot of farms, but our average farm milks about 120 cows. Um, and uh, we're in all six New England states and in New York State. Um, we own Cabot Cheese. Hopefully you've heard about it. Even more, hopefully you buy our products. Um, and um, we're very or oriented on communities, um, on benefits to dairy farmers. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit today about how we've had to change, um, how we've had to pivot, how we've had to do many of the things that you're talking about today. So I think, can I have the next slide? Okay, um, we've been around for over a century now. Most people don't know that. They hear Agrimark and it sounds like this industrial cooperative. Uh, in reality, um, we've been, when we started out, we were New England milk producers uh, over a century ago. We merged with Connecticut milk producers, Massachusetts milk producers, all the, the different co-ops over the last hundred years. Um, and in 1980, we really did a pivot. Um, we were Yankee milk producers, and um, we knew that farmers needed some value added, okay? Um, and so these are some of the things. Uh, this is sort of part of our mission statement informally. A century of dairy farm families working cooperatively to meet changing circumstances, complex challenges, and new opportunities. And we, that's something we're, we pride ourselves that we've been able to do. In 1980, we knew we had to be more value added. So um, our farmers got together, put up additional money, and we bought the HP Hood Company, okay? Um, half of, uh, half, we were half owners, Agway, the farm supplier, were the other half. But back then, the government was, the, the antitrust stuff was so tight that we were about 30% of the market, and they said, well, you can buy half the company, but you can't sit on the board of directors because your farmer's supplying the milk. So here we are with all this money invested, and we couldn't even be on the board of directors. So after about almost 10 years, it was not going in the direction we wanted. So we actually sold the rest of the business to Agway. And many of you know Agway eventually went out of business um, on doing it. And eventually the Hood Company got sold to John Canem and his family, who's actually done a really good job. They, they really have a, the Hood was sliding downhill fast in the 90s. And John and his family have really brought them back in many ways. And they buy a lot of our milk. We work closely with them on a lot of, uh, a lot of issues. Um, but when we, when we divested ourselves of them, we had to decide who we were. Were we still going to be just a milk marketing, just sell our milk? No, our farmers wanted to be value added. So we looked for opportunities. And one of them was handed to us that we didn't, even, we didn't pursue because we didn't know they were available. And it was the Cabot Creamery Cooperative, located in Cabot, Vermont. And it had some serious issues. In 1989, the milk prices were very good. And so their farmers started making more milk, they started making more cheese, and they filled up every warehouse they could with high value cheese. And it takes a year or two to age the cheese. And a year or two later, the price of milk had collapsed. And the price of cheese had collapsed. And they had borrowed money to pay their farmers for the milk, for the cheese. And now they didn't have the money to pay it back. And so they were struggling. And it looked like at one point they were going to go out of business and have to close. And the farmers would lose a lot of their equity, might not even get all their milk checks. Uh, it was a real severe problem. So we offered the merge with them. And their first response was, no, we want to sell our company and get a lot of money for it. So they put it on the block to sell. Nobody wanted it. They, it would have come with all this high-priced cheese, and it was a small little plant. It was just in Cabot, Vermont. 
Um, and so nobody wanted it. So at the end of the day, they came back to us and we said, okay, we'll merge with you. We secured the milk checks of all their farmers. So the farmers got paid. Um, we secured the equity that the farmers had in the business. Um, and so it really merged in with our organization and we became, all the farmers involved, theirs and ours, became the owners of Cabot Creamery. Um, that was one of the best things we ever did. When we, when we began with them, they were less than a $50 million company. Today, our farmers own a six to $700 million company. Our product is available, uh, used to be basically Vermont and some surrounding states back then. Um, now it's the whole East Coast, it's, it's the nation. We have product, you can pretty much every state you can find our product in. A lot of it's in the Walmarts, um, Sam's Club, um, Costco's of the world because they want to buy our product and have it out in those areas. Uh, Trader Joe out in uh, California, um, Whole Foods. Um, so you can, you, can buy, you can get it in a lot of different places. But that's sort of how we, we started moving with Cabin. But then again, we were throwing a, a, a curveball. Two years later, um, there's a plant in Middlebury, Vermont, owned by Kraft that made Swiss cheese. Suddenly Kraft announced that the Swiss cheese market was not like it wanted to be, so they were going to close the plant. Well, this plant took the milk from two to 300 dairy farms. Back probably then it was three or 400 dairy farms. We were the supplier. We needed a market for that. So they offered to sell us the plant at book value. Good amount of land, wasn't a bad plant. Um, book value was, I think, two and a half, three million dollars. Sounds like a lot of money, but not really for a plant like that. Uh, would have cost 50 to 100 million to rebuild it if you wanted to do it from scratch. So it looked like a good deal. The problem was it made Swiss cheese. And just Swiss cheese was out of fashion and nobody really wanted it. Um, so we, we said, okay, well, what are we gonna do? So we talked to Swiss Valley Farms in Iowa. And you would, what do they make? They make a lot of Swiss cheese. So we said, what do you think about the markets and that? And they said, oh, you don't want to make Swiss cheese. It's a terrible market, okay? In fact, we think it'd be great if we could have one less Swiss cheese plant in this country. But they had a cheddar cheese plant that they had just closed. And they had only opened it like six, seven years before. But that was a point where a lot of the farms in the Midwest were stop milking cows in Iowa, Indiana, uh, Illinois. I mean, not Minnesota, Wisconsin, but the lower part, um, because they were taking their crops, their corn and, and soybeans, and they were selling it directly, and they made more money than running it through cows. Yeah. Uh, I am um, in about 1993, okay? Yeah, stop me at any time, that, that, that's, a good, that's a good point. I lived it, so it all blurs with me uh, on what we did. But, so um, at that point, we said, okay, um, we spent about $10 million. You know, farmers had to ante up money and equity and whatever, and we bought the, the equipment and made it a cheddar cheese plant. And we actually did a fantastic job. We won every award after the couple years, within a couple years, we were winning world's best cheddar, coming out of that plant, coming out of the, we still had the Cabot plant in Cabot, Vermont. Um, so Iowa? Iowa? to the, the old plant, uh, craft facility um, in Middlebury. And, um, and then you know, we converted that over, did a really great job with that. And then we got thrown another curveball in about 1998. Um, whey production. Whey is the byproduct of cheese making. We make about 50 million pounds of cheese in our Middlebury plant every year. We make about 100 million in all our facilities. We have three facilities. But we make about 50 million there. And it takes 500 million pounds of milk. When you do the math, there's 450 million pounds left over. What is that? That's whey, okay? And in the past, you'd run it through sewer systems. The whey past, you know, 80 years ago, you might run it into streams. I mean, I'm not suggesting that we did that, but that's what happened. That's what they did with the whey product, okay? Um, but you don't do that today. Of course, of course, you can't do that, and you don't want to do that. So we had to then spend $20 million to build a whey processing facility to handle the waste. After we just did the whole thing for about $13 million. Um, but we looked at it and we said, we need to become a whey seller. So we did. And we were able to pay off that $20 million. We earned it back, and we didn't quite pay it off because we had bonds and other things, but we earned it back in about three years, making whey protein concentrate, and we made 80% protein whey and then we made something called permeate, which is lactose, the milk sugar, okay? 
we had a market domestically. But then our market suddenly disappeared after two years, and we had to become an international seller of whey from our plant in um, Middlebury, Vermont. And we actually did that, and we became one of the leading whey protein concentrate sellers in the international market. We move it to probably 20 different countries, okay? And we make a really good, high-quality product. And we have an advantage over some of the way the cheese plants in other areas. Our cheddar, as you probably know, is white cheddar. We make some yellow, because there are some misguided consumers who think that cheddar should be yellow. No, we love, we love, we don't care what color you want. Um, but um, because we don't put food coloring in our cheese vats, our whey is white. Okay? And whey is used as an ingredient in so many other products. On the supermarket shelves, hundreds of products. Okay? Well, when you mix white whey in, you don't change the color pattern or whatever, you, whatever you're making. But when you add yellow whey, you do. So people really prefer ours just for the color and the quality, quantity. Um, I don't want to say this against other um, cheese companies in like Wisconsin, but what the heck. Um, there, you know, a lot of times, in order to get the, the, the way that people want, you have to take the yellow whey and you have to bleach it. Okay, it's, it, now, okay, it's food grade bleach, it's not, you know, it's not like, ooh, kind of thing, but who really wants to hear, yeah, we bleached the whey in, in, in this baby food or something, you know what I mean? Um, so we don't have to do that, um, and that's been a real positive for us. So we kept marching along, now we had a whey business, we're about uh, 2002, um, we had our plant in Cabot, Vermont. We also did our cut and wrap of our cheese. We had this new facility in Middlebury, uh, relatively new. The plant's been there for decades, but not as a cheddar cheese plant. And then farmers came to us in upstate New York, and there was a plant in Shattagay, New York. Shattagay is a stone's throw from Canada, and it's about 30, 40 miles west of the Vermont border. And it was being run, it had been, it had been around for over 100 years. And it was being run by Valio Co-op, based out of Finland. Valio owned 20 cheese plants. 18 in Finland, one I believe in Russia, and one in Chattagay, New York. That plant had been owned by Dean Foods, it had been owned by so many other companies over time. Well, they decided they were gonna close it. Well, the farmers were gas. there was a home for their milk. So it was a little Shattagate co-op that came to us and said, if we join your cooperative and help put up some money, can you um, purchase that plant? It, once again, it was like a couple million dollars for this plant. We need a lot of work, but it was, it was a good deal. Um, and we felt we didn't need to do a whole lot of other things because we had Cabot Marketing. We didn't need to double our marketing staff. They had a McAdam brand that had been around since 1876. So we got involved in that too. And we ended up buying the plant we put about $10 million in it over the last 10, 12 years because it was an old plant. That plant facility used to have a train station running through it that would pick up milk cans to bring down, to, and that was 100 years ago, okay? It's been, the cheese part of it was built about 75 years ago, and a lot of it is still there. We're in the process of a complete rebuild for $30 million that we have to do there. Um, but, and that's, that's farmer money, it's, it's, it's expensive to do that. But so we got involved with them. Now we had three cheese plants, okay? All three cheese plants, by the way, were gonna close, or likely would close if we didn't step in. So these were not like we went in and said, hey, we wanna buy your cheese plant, we wanna buy your company for millions and millions of dollars. We bought them because farmers were desperate and we're farmers too. And we need a market for our milk and to make value added products. So that's where we sort of had to pivot and turn. Then there were a bunch of smaller co-ops that were members of allied co-ops in New York. They were struggling. They wanted to join us. Now it's about 2005, 2006. And so they did. And now we, you know, that's why we've kept 1,100 farmers. Um, at one point, we had like 4,000 farmers um, without them. Without, this was like 20, 30 years ago. Um, so we've constantly had to pivot as we do that. Can, um, give me another slide. I forgot I had slides up here. Uh, sorry. Um, and actually, this is the only one. This is our story and uh, some nice slides about our farmer members, some of our farms, you know, some of our Cabot products. Uh, in the left-hand corner is um, our other products that um, we do internationally. Uh, we pick up milk every day. We pick up a tanker load of milk about every nine minutes. 
of every day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and we have to find a home for it. Half of it goes to our own plants. We also have a butter powder plant in West Springfield, Massachusetts. The other half is sold to our, to our customers. I'm doing it, but we have a lot of milk that's flowing. Next slide, please. Um, a big part of what we were doing in marketing, and I, I really want to change gears a little bit and talk about how we've done our marketing as well and how we've made dramatic changes in that. This is our point that we have on a lot of our products. 100% of our profits go to our dairy farmers. You hear about a lot like 2% of the profits go to food banks or these companies all say these small percentages. We have 100% because our farmers own the business. Next slide. So, when we looked at our marketing, we found that we could not compete with the craft and the Sargentos of the world. We didn't have the money. Marketing spends tens of millions of dollars in those companies, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. So we needed to do something different. You'll see that you very rarely see Cabot on television. If you do, it's probably related to Vermont ski resorts because there's some money in the state for Vermont ski resorts and we just tag on board, okay? Um, and the same thing, you very seldom see us in, in, in newspapers anymore or magazines because they're just too expensive to try to do that. So we decided to go a different route. And one of it was to work within our communities to say who we really are as dairy farmers. You know that I can't tell you how many dairy farmers are members of fire departments, rescue squads, so involved in their communities. Okay, that's, that's typical for our membership. Um, and so we looked at doing some things. This is called the Farmer's Gratitude Grill. Might be a little hard to see, but it's a sort of like a food truck that we go up and down the East Coast and we provide free food for different groups over time. Um, Habitat for the Humanity, we've been there many, many times when they're building houses in groups. Um, we've done it for uh, fire departments, rescue squads, you name it. We're out there doing that. At the same time, we do something called random acts of cheddar. Okay? I mean, you hear random acts of kindness, we do random acts of cheddar where we, some, we go to these places and, you know, in the middle of the day, and we drop off cheese for the fire, everyone in the fire department. We drop off cheese for the rescue squads. We drop off cheese for the food bank. So we call it random acts of cheddar that we do it. And we get a tremendous amount of coverage from radio, television, and others for doing this. We think far more than we would than trying to buy the time. And we get it in such a positive light. I have another slide. Okay, um, and this is sort of the same type of thing. It looks at you know, what we're doing, community tour 2016, we're gonna be doing this summer. So we, we continue this. We don't do it every year. We have different kind of marketing programs, and depending on how much money marketing has, this year we're gonna do that community tour. Another slide. Okay, um, this is, we have a reward volunteers, an app, okay, that people can record how many hours they volunteer. Okay, and with that, when they reach certain levels, they get free gifts from our partners, from us and our partners. It might be free cheese, Ben and Jerry's is a partner, Seventh Generation, King Arthur Flower. They provide um, rewards for people keeping these apps. Okay? It's been one of the most positive things we've done. I, I don't even remember the last count of how many thousands of people are on this app. Okay? When do you have Kraft doing something like that on volunteering? They want an app to say, we'll give you a coupon. Okay, we give an app that says, what good do you do and how can we help? Next slide. Okay, um, we do what we call celebrity cruises. We go out to organizations and we say, who are the real celebrities here? We're not going to get an endorsement, you know, from Brad Pitt or something, okay? What we do is we look at all the different groups of people who volunteer. And like I said, it might be food banks. Um, it might be... Um, schools, it might be different, you know, uh, American Cancer Society, and they nominate people. And we send, I think it's almost up to 100 people on a cruise, nice cruise. The one coming up um, next year is um, an Alaskan cruise. We fly them out to Seattle, we go on a week long Alaskan cruise, we get a bunch of our staff people that go on and treat them like celebrities that they are. We get tremendous amount of advertising on that. Okay, I can turn around, you can turn around and say, well, you're so generous, what, you know, you're spending farmers' money. No, when we do this, we get invited to TV stations, to radio stations. Why are you doing this? Who's doing this? 
We get such tremendous coverage on doing it, and we do it for the right reasons. Do you know? I mean, that's what I'm saying. When I read about some of the, the, the work on this conference, you know, that Shannon and others put out, you know, um, is exactly what we're doing. Right? We're benefiting by it. Of course we are. Our farmers have to make money. Our company has to make money. We have, we have a thousand, eight or 900 employees now. But we do it in a way that everybody benefits at the end of the day. Another slide? Um, this is one of my favorites. We call it the Farmer Gratitude Tour. We go to New York City metropolitan area. We've done it about every, well, I think this will be our second time. We're, we're, we're going to do it again in another year or two. Um, this one was this past March. We brought down 95 of our farmers, 95. Um, we went to 38 large stores in the metropolitan area, most in, in New York City boroughs, and for four days. And we thanked our consumers for buying our products. We gave samples, and our members said, thank you. New Yorkers from Manhattan, they were floor struck. Who are these people, and why are they thanking us, and what do they want? <laughs> you know? um, and in fact, the first time we went down, we had picket signs that we said, thank you. You know what I mean? It was like this thing saying, you want to thank you? Well, New Yorkers, they don't read signs. They just thought, oh my god, i got to stay away from this. They're picketing, they aren't striked, they're this or that. And so it was a little tough at first. Um, so our farmers actually had to like corral the consumers. You know what I mean? Can I talk to you about this? A lot of the consumers were like, no, 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 you can't. Um, but eventually we got to them, and this time around, it was great. We had a we have a bus, have a bus that goes around. Um, every once in a while, that um, after the after the, the uh, stuff is done for the day, we travel around the city. We stop. People would uh, would come out. Our farmers would come out of the bus and hand out cheese just randomly al along the road, and and people were shocked by it. Okay. We got such tremendous support, we got media coverage, we got everything you could imagine out of doing this. Next slide. This is one of my favorites from a farmer point of view. We have Open Farm Sunday. Um, 50 of our farms have agreed to open up their farms. So consumers and neighbors and whatever could go visit that farm. We usually have a day in October. You can see the map on the left, um, that's of the northeast. And in fact, um, you can see all the different locations. They're in all seven states, New York and even Rhode Island. There's like six farms left, most of them are ours. And um, they want to be consumer oriented as well. So um, we've worked on that issue. On 2009, our first year, we had over 2,000 people come to the farms. 2011, we had 6,000 people come to the farms. 2013, we had almost 12,000 people come to the farms. Uh, we usually do it every two years. Our marketing budget was, was hurt because we were, our farmers were struggling in a lot of areas last year, so we put it off to this year, so this October, and we're expecting to have 15 to 20,000 people. In 13, we had about 12,000 people on doing it. Um, not only that, our farmers, a lot of our farmers would like make grilled cheese for the people visiting and they take donations, and they do it for you know, fire department, rescue squad, whatever function they had. We'd give them the cheese to make the grilled cheese. Then they'd sell it to the visitors. You know, a couple bucks a sandwich or whatever, and the money would be donated. So we can feed back upon that at the same time. A whole different way of doing marketing. Next slide. And then, of course, we have our um, Facebook and and you know, all our social um, marketing that we do. And you can see some of the numbers that are there. Um, you know, we Twitter, we Pinterest, we do all the things that please don't ask me any questions about. Um, my, kids feed, my kids put me on all these things and I get all these things on Facebook saying I want to be your friend and I'm like, no, I don't want any more friends. Because <laughs> I really don't know what's going on here. But I have, we have a whole staff at Cabot. I don't deal on that end of it, but we get very involved we were one of the first people that did that. We have a tremendous marketing staff. We have, you know, our head of marketing is someone by the name of Roberta McDonald, and probably a lot of you know Roberta. She's a visionary on these things, she really is. Uh, she's very enthusiastic, sometimes overly enthusiastic. Um, sometimes you need to take, I heard people laughing, you need to take Roberta in slow doses, but she's a visionary, and she really wants to do these things, and that's really, really positive on doing it. Next slide. Um, sustainability. 
How am I doing on time? Am I okay on time? Okay, well, we'll, we'll assume. Oh, okay. okay, very good. It's your time at the end, Gabriel. So, um, okay, um, we have done so much on sustainability. We were one of the first ones, like 10, 12 years ago, that started working on sustainability. We have a sustainability director, one of our higher level employees in the company. We call it living within our means, ensuring the means to live. And sustainability is the soul of every good farmer and at the heart of our co-op success. Okay? Our farmers, many of them have been around the farms for hundreds of years. We're in New England. You know I mean? New England's been in agriculture for four centuries, longer than that, five centuries by the time you get done. So we have farmers who have sustained their farms. So we have worked very hard in that regard. Next slide. Okay? And we have a group called SUSFACT, which is really the Agrimark Sustainable Farms Committee. We end up often having 30, 40 people, farmers, on that, sometimes more. Um, and we see sustainability as a three-legged stool. Some people only think about environmental on sustainability. Okay, what is it doing for the environment? But it's also a social part. What is it doing for society? And just as important as someone who works for farmers, it's an economic part. Because if farmers can't make money to support their families and their farms, they're not going to be there to do the other things. You can't ask farmers to do more environmental things and ask them to pay for it if they don't have the money from the earnings of, of selling their milk or their cows or whatever they're selling. Um, so it is. It's a three-tiered area. And it's also economic for the communities. Vermont did a study, and they showed that the average cow generates about $14,000 of economic activity a year. One cow. So if I'm talking about 100 cows, for an easy math, that's $1.4 million of economic activity a year from a 100 cow farm. That's the average of 120, so that's what, 1.6, 1.7 million dollars? And that's for the whole community from start to finish. Okay, they use a lot of services. Okay, they contribute a lot. We have, like I said, we're like eight, 900 people. Most of those do our packaging, shipping, other things. Okay, they're only there because the farmers are there making the milk, investing in the plants, and providing it to consumers. Okay, it's all about the economics of the farms and the economics of the community. Next one, please, Shanta. Um, we look at energy efficiency opportunities. We do a tremendous amount of this, methane digesters. We work with some on solar. We work with some on, uh, on windmills. Um, so we, we look for opportunities where our farmers can make more money. Farmers need to have sufficient revenue. Whatever that revenue comes from, it, it, I won't say it doesn't matter, but it's important as a revenue source. We even work with our farmers who we have, an, we have an agreement with our farmers to market all their milk. So we, we, we're supposed to receive 100% of their milk. But some of our farmers are very innovative. Some of them are artists and cheesemakers. Some of the best in the world. So we allow them to keep that milk. You could say, well, isn't that the right thing to do? Oh, it is. But as a marketing co-op, we, we don't have to do that. But we do that because anything that will keep a farmer in business helps the rest of the farmers and helps our cooperative. We have groups in Connecticut called the Farmer's Cow. You may see their brand in Connecticut of, of fluid milk. Rhode Island has Rhodey Fresh milk. Um, our farmers of Western Massachusetts has milk, um, has packaged milk. Um, we have uh, Hudson Valley Fresh in New York. Um, that's a tremendous amount of sales down in New York City. Those are our farmer members. Because, and the rest of the milk they don't need, they ship to us and we use it for whatever. Okay? You have to work with your owners. Some places don't do that. Some are just saying, no, you're supposed to send your milk to us. We, wanna, we want it to us. And we say, no, we have op they have opportunities to help make them additional money. And it's going to keep them in business. And it's going to benefit us and everybody else at the end of the day. Um, our family farms of Western Massachusetts. Oh, it is an Agamore. OK, let me keep something in mind. It's not an Agamark brand. The members of Agramark are members of that cooperative that do that. Same with Farmer's Cow. That's farmers in, in eastern Connecticut. Okay? I, think, I think everyone's an Agramark member. But they created their own business and get all the profits from it. Rhodey Fresh, same thing. Um, in Hudson Valley Fresh, same thing. They're not Agramark businesses. Okay? They're Agramark member businesses. So they're very market-oriented. They not only own cabbage cheese, they own these other businesses. 
value added is where farmers have to be these days. Okay? The only farmers that can survive without being value added are extremely large farms. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 cows. We have some of those, and they're family farms. They have multiple generations. You know, they're great farms, and they need that to meet all the regulations. Those, those, those farms have like one or two people who just fill out forms and do regulations. Okay, it's, it's horrendous. How does a small farm get away with that? They're lucky if they have two people. One's a herdsman and one's a crop manager. Okay? I mean, it's just horrible. The things they're asking farmers these days. Next slide, please. Um, this, um, this shows uh, some of the things we're doing in our own operations on it. We switched over all our operations to natural gas. Most, you know, all, all our plants now have natural gas. Some of it's compressed natural gas because we don't have a pipeline in Middlebury yet. I don't want to get involved in that. Um, some people don't like pipelines. They don't like natural gas. They don't like fracking. I can tell you, it's a lot cleaner than number six fuel oil. Okay? And we are drying um, that, pow that whey powder, 450 million pounds. You know, we, we, we use membranes to take out most of the water, but then we have to dry it. It uses a lot of energy. You can't use solar. You can't use wind. You can't generate what you need. Number six fuel oil can do it. Now we're using natural gas. I'm doing it. So we work hard on that. And we try to do what we think is right. It lowers our costs, without a doubt, which is one of our missions too. But it also lowers the amount of energy uh, for the environment. Uh, next slide. Um, we're also what's called a B co-op, a, a B corp. Okay? I won't go too much into that because I don't want to spend too much time. But this is a co-op that really is geared towards sustainability and it's doing right for different aspects. It's hard to be a B co-op, it really is. I think I saw some, some signs about it uh, here and at the other location. Um, we worked hard at doing that. Um, next slide. Um, you know, declaration of interdependence that we have to do. We have to get a scorecard on doing it. And you have to have at least an 80 on the scorecard and we had an 84. When I first looked at it, I'm like, we should do better than 84. Yeah, I want it to be 100 or 99 or whatever. But it's hard. It really is hard. They ask a lot of you to do this. So the fact that we could reach that level, and we're working to improve that level on a regular basis, says a lot about our, our owners, our farmer owners, a lot about our employees. Um, we have great employees. We have won the World Cheese Championship three different times. Our butter, our yogurt, our other things have won all kinds of awards. We won the best Greek yogurt in the country. Okay, and we don't even make it, we, we, we're making more of it. We don't even sell it in small containers like you see in the stores. We sell it in quarts. Yeah. Cabot. Cabot. You'll, you'll, um, you'll see it in the wells of the dairy section, the low part, because it's usually two quarts. Now we're selling three quarts. I'm sorry, uh, one quart or it could be multiple quarts. Okay. Um, we only sell it in a few brands, a few types. Uh, a uh, plain 2%, a uh, plain 10%. That's what standard Greek yogurt is. Used in place of sour cream and other things. We sell a vanilla and a strawberry at 2%. Um, but because we've done so well, we have companies now come to us and starting in July, we'll be selling a coconut 2% and a honey 2%. Okay, and we've been asked by our customers in Florida to do that. We have a lot of business, the snowbirds in Florida. But you should be able to buy it here starting in July or August. Really good product. Really, really good product. Um, and so, you know, B Corp means a lot to us. And like I said, we've been working on it for several years. Next slide. Um, and you know, we have it on our packages, um, you know, purchasing with a purpose. Um, you can go online and find more about a B Corporation. Um, then, you know, I, I know the peripherals of it, on it, um, because I'm not involved to that on a day to day. But it's been, a, it's been on our agenda for a long time since it really started. And we were so bleed, uh, pleased that we could make that cut on it. Next slide. Um, this is the reasons why, as a co-op, we do at the end of the day. We're owned by dairy farmers. We're owned by our, our farmers. And we have to do right by them. Fortunately, we have farmers who want to do right by everybody else as well. And that's been a real positive. Next slide. I just put some nice, beautiful slides. I think most of them are in Vermont. Next one. Um, and then the well, next one, please. Um, so that's who we are. Agrimark Family Dairy Farms is our cooperative. Of course, you know Cabot Cheese. Macadam is our New York brand. 
um, Agrimark whey and dairy proteins. That's our international brand for whey. So we're all over the place these days, and farmers are benefiting by it. And I think everyone else is benefiting by it as well. And that's what we're about. So, we'll have some time for some questions first? Or, yeah, questions. What, what percentage of Vermont dairy farmers are part of Agrimark? About know? a third. About a third. About a third. We're down, I hate to say this, but we're down to like 750 dairy farms in Vermont. We have thousands. And so we have 250 to 300 in our cooperative. Yeah. Um, so now, uh, with whey production, is there, um, you would think that with all the amount of whey that you're producing, that you would also be able to create an uh, uh, interdependence with uh, pig farmers, be able to supply food to them so you could uh, help create a, a, a bacon market, a pig market for Vermont based on feeding of whey. And that's a lot of whey. That's a lot of, you know, it, is, well, that, is what you're doing with it now more productive than creating a Yes, yes, but we're open to that. We're very open to that. What we do is we make two basic products. Whey protein concentrate, that's 80% protein. That is the most digestible protein in the world, literally, for babies, adults, everything else, okay? What's left is the milk sugar, okay? And that's a permeate. That's what you're saying for, for pigs, hogs, and what have you. We actually sell that at a fairly good price to China, more so than we could get here, okay? But... That may be an idea we need to pursue because China's buying less. And by the time we get it over there, I'm going to talk to our guys about that. They look for any opportunity. Wherever we can make the most for our farmers, and if it's a dead even, I'd rather sell it to farmers here in Vermont or in, in the Northeast and bring it over to China. But they, have, you know, they, they like our product too because the piglets can grow really fast on it and, and what have you. Um, so yeah, that's what we do right now with it. We sell some in the U.S., but there's so much of that product, that's part of the problem. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of whey, I, a couple of times I've been in cheese shops where they have whey products that are not protein powder. They're just kind of like little whey donuts or not, not like just basically clumps of whey. Yeah. Uh, is that something you've ever thought about marketing? Um, well, you can just, you can straight dry whey with all the ingredients. That's what a lot of people use. We break it down because we can get better value for it. Uh, so we have looked at that. Actually, you're going to see Cabot um, whey. That's you know how bodybuilders buy these big containers of whey powder. Well, we're looking at the same thing. And in fact, you can buy, I think it's like a pound and a half packages of whey that easily dissolves under the Cabot brand. And we just started selling that a few months ago to get high value for it. Yeah. Yeah. On your issue of the needing a lot of waste heat to dry the whey. Yeah. Have you looked at uh, aligning with a power company to use the waste heat from power generation, you know, a combined heat and power plant? Um, we have. I know our guys have looked at that. It just, there isn't a place. It's all, all our way is brought to Middlebury, Vermont, because we combine it all, because we can't afford to have multiple way, way processing plants. So there really hasn't been an opportunity to do that. I can tell you, if there's something that would save us money, or help the environment a lot more, we would have looked at it. So I, I'm not an expert in that, but uh, I know we have looked at various things to do, particularly when we're using number six fuel oil. We were desperate to get out of that. So, do you have a question? Yeah. The price of milk is very, very low at this point. Yes. Does Agrimark pay any additional, or do you go with the, you know, I'm thinking in New York anyway, people are saying it's 13.50, give or take, 100 weight. Um, most of our members right now are getting somewhere in the 14 to 16 dollars. We do pay, we pay premiums. We pay over the minimums. Um, uh, before we had a lot of milk, we, there's milk being dumped in the Northeast, it's horrible to say, but we've lost, not us, we bought plants, but other people have closed them um, on doing it. Um, in 2014, we gave our farmers over 35 million dollars on premiums, they got every month, and on profits on doing it. We're down, this year we'll probably be closer, I think our budget is like 23 or 24, because there's so much milk, our customers won't pay the premiums. Not all of them. We have really good quality, so we can still get some, but and there's, there's a struggle. Farmers absolutely are struggling right now. Their prices are down 30, 40% from 2004. So basically you still have to fight for, you have to still sell them. 
yeah, at the end of the day, we can, we, if we go to a customer and said, our farmers are really good guys, they need the money, they can buy it from somebody else for cheaper amount, and they do. Um, and the same thing with our cheese. You know, we have, we have a good customer base, I'd say maybe 20, 25%, that will go into the store and pick up cabbage cheese, don't even look at the price, because they know it's the best. Unfortunately, there's a lot of groups out there, you know, for their own economic reasons, have to look at it and say, wow, this brand's cheaper, or Kraft is on sale, or whatever. So we have to be competitive. So we can't just charge any price on doing it. Um, we do get a premium every place we can. Um, and if we're the same price as these other places, people will buy us. Okay, we don't have to be cheaper. We can be the same, because our quality is better. Yeah. That was fascinating, especially all the marketing that uh, marketing means you guys are doing. I found that really, really interesting. Uh, how's everyone doing? Yeah, a little low energy, possibly. Let's let's do let's let's everyone stand up for a minute, and we're just going to do a little stretch. So, I'm a really big fan of just activating the body. Especially since we're uh, we're sitting so much, sitting is the new smoking, as they say. So you're just going to stretch your left arm out, and you're just going to drop your head to the right. Okay, and you're going to take your hand, and you're not going to pull it, but you're just going to place your hand here. And you're going to feel that stretch in your left side body. Does everyone feel that? Mm -hmm. And you're gonna stretch out your fingers. And that's how to feel the stretch. Don't tweak your neck. And you can do it sitting down too. And then to come out of this, you're gonna actually push your head back up into the center, just to make sure you support the neck. And then we're gonna do the other side. Don't pull, just rest your, your hand on your head and then push it back up. See, don't we already feel better? Oh yeah. Very nice. Thanks for participating in that with me. I really just was doing it for selfish reasons. Um, so my name's Gabriel Cole. I actually grew up in South Burlington, Vermont. Um, I now own and operate a business based out of San Francisco, and we also have clients in New York. I'm gonna talk to you about the evolution of our model. Um, we're at a very different stage than Bob, and the work that he's doing, we're still in startup mode. Um, but I, I, I hope this is going to be an interesting story to you all. Um, was was born into a family uh, that was incredibly loving and supportive and really focused on community and, and food and uh, conviviality at the core. And growing up in, in Vermont, as much of you know, these kinds of values that uh, are represented so well here at Slow Living Summit were intrinsic to, to a lot of us, right? We grew up in nature, we grew up in family, grew up in community. And those types of values are becoming less and less. You know, we're, we're becoming more disconnected from, from those people, those really humanistic values. And I've always wondered how to bring that back into the fold on a larger scale. And I, and I love that we're exploring that in, in so many different topics uh, these days, and, and certainly here at the summit. Uh, I, I actually went to Essex Technical School in high school. Does anyone know about Essex vocational program? Yeah, culinary program? So I learned how to cook my junior year in high school, um, which was a fascinating way to start to educate yourself in high school about what you want to be when you grow up, right? And a lot of us don't know. A lot of us are coming out of college and we're still not sure. And a lot of us are transitioning careers every decade now, right? The, the average American has seven different careers in their lifespan. That's, that's, that's insane, and that's, that's uh, uncharacteristic of what's, what's happened in the past. And learning about this stuff in high school, I found, I found my calling in high school. I, I, I found something that was instantly gratifying, it was nurturing, it connected me to community, and, and it, it, uh, it had the ability to really transcend and transform people's lives. It definitely did uh, for me. I went on to work, um, my first job ever actually was at Perry's Fish House, is the crab out front waving at people. Does anyone remember that? Perry's on Shelburne Road? No? A couple of you? 
I know some of my family here remembers that. Um, I went on to work at Cafe Shelburne, um, then at Shelburne Farms. Um, I worked at the Foxfire Inn in Stowe. Anyone ever been to the Foxfire Inn? Kate and Bob, great people. Um, and kind of cut my chops in the, in the Vermont culinary scene. I went to work for Iron Wolf, Klaus Bockfeldt. Does anyone know Iron Wolf in Burlington? Incredible establishment, which is, which is now shuttered, but um, did incredible French food. And this man actually taught me a lot about conservation. He used to save the butter pats from, from the pounds of butter that we would, that we would use. And, and he would save these butter pats so that when we went to reheat our food in the oven, we would put the butter pats on top of the food so the food wouldn't dry out in the oven. And maybe there was a little morsel, a little residue of butter still left, which he loved. You know, I love that idea. Um, he, would save, he would save plastic wrap. We would, have to, we would have to very carefully take the plastic wrap off of everything and, and dry it off and then save it. And he was, he was frugal in every way possible, but he actually taught me so much about conservation that I give him credit for today. And, and he did it for, for, for budgetary reasons, but, but he didn't realize how much of a conservationist he was. And he was running a high-end French restaurant at an incredibly low food cost because of these reasons. He's the only man, he's the only person I've ever seen who actually chops bones. Okay, Does any, have any of you ever made a, a, a demi-gloss, a stock? from veal bones or from beef, beef bones, a couple of you. Okay, so you can actually chop the bones to release more collagen. So that was the first three months of my life at the Iron Wolf, was chopping bones. And, and of course, there's fragments that are going up everywhere, like flying into your eyes and hitting the ceiling. And, and so every day I would, uh, every, I guess every Wednesday I would come in and I would chop bones. That was my only job. And you know, you gotta imagine like you're holding this giant beef bone and you're yielding a giant cleaver and it's like slippery and you've got your goggles on and there's this short little German man yelling at you to chop more precisely and incredibly scary experience, but I learned a lot about that, right? And he just wanted to get more bang for his buck. That's why he was doing it. Um, so after, after those experiences, I went to Champlain College studied health restaurant management for a year and actually dropped out because I wanted to go uh, start a business. And that was the first brick and mortar I started. It was actually um, a Jewish kosher deli in Atlanta, Georgia. It was a very short-lived establishment, but taught me a lot about entrepreneurship, about brick and mortars, about the restaurant life from the owner-operator perspective. And Fast forward to San Francisco, a few years later, I went out to California, followed, followed my brother in the sunshine, really, no offense to you Vermonters, but you know, California, we get a few more days of sunshine out there, and sometimes that can be really valuable. Followed him, was in LA for a few years, and then went up to San Francisco and actually took a job at Google in their, uh, in their food department. And back then, that was uh, 06, um, we were spending billion dollars. We go back actually, Sean, to one. Thanks. This is my last day at Google. Um, they didn't want me to leave, so they wrapped me in plastic wrap and stuck me in the walk-in um, in the hopes that, that I wouldn't go anywhere. But this is, this is back when I was still cooking, and Google was doing huge volume. Um, we were spending a billion dollars annually on food and labor to feed roughly 25,000 people. Now Google is over 55,000 people. Um, they've probably hired another 5,000 even just since I read their, their volume a few months ago. But um, this taught me an incredible amount about the California food and, and ag landscape along with entrepreneurship. We used, to, we used to just buy stuff off of the back of farmers' trucks back then when there was, there was a little less oversight. Um, and it, was, it, was, it opened my eyes to this, to this world. And um, I actually left to go work for Slow Food Nation. Does anyone know about, I know you all know about Slow Food, but do you know about Slow Food Nation? Slow Food Nation was an event held in San Francisco in 2008. Um, it, was a, it was a one weekend event and it gathered about a quarter of a million people in San Francisco and, and we planted victory gardens and, at City Hall and um, we had a taste pavilion and we did this, we did incredible stuff, but it lasted a weekend. And that was back in the day where I was in um, event production and I was realizing we were spending all these resources 
to produce uh, an event for a weekend and then you would walk away and, and you wouldn't have any kind of lasting content, really. And, you know, and this is a one-time thing, so it's not, it's not like slow living where you get to come back every year and connect with the same people. This is a one-time thing. And the, the greatest thing about Slow Food Nation was the networking and the relationships that it built. And, and that is still uh, a cornerstone to, to my work today is, is relationships. Luckily, they also sent me to Terra Madre. Um, does anyone know about Terra Madre? It's the International Slow Food Festival. Has anyone ever been to Terra Madre? Well, I would strongly encourage you all to, to check, check it out. They, um, they offer scholarships and they take delegates from every state every year. Uh, every two years is the conference, but it's the International Slow Food Conference and it's, it's an incredibly enriching experience. I, I left Slow Food Nation, it was a, it was a one-time event, and, and decided that what I really wanted to do was help entrepreneurs. And I wanted to help entrepreneurs mainly because I wanted to make the responsible, amazing food that I ate every day um, accessible and available to more people. And I didn't want to just do that by starting one product. I wanted to actually um, help many businesses. Um, to see if we could do that. And this was, this was at my first office. Um, my first fair resources office was probably 09. Didn't keep a very together desk back then, but um, got, had dogs visit me and worked a lot on my own. Was a sole entrepreneur for a long time, about four years. How many of you actually in the audience are entrepreneurs? How many of you own businesses or consider yourselves entrepreneurs? So about half. And how many of you are solo entrepreneurs? How many of you work on your own? Yeah, only three or four of you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough sometimes to be a solo entrepreneur. You can feel you know, a little bit like in a vacuum. And um, I, I struggled. I struggled mainly because relationships are so key to, to me and my success and my passion. And I also couldn't figure out how to make a consultancy work. So I started trying out other business models. And this was an incubator model called a temporary offering. Um, we, we opened up a shared use commercial kitchen and uh, incubator space and pop-up um, restaurant. Um, this is uh, mid-market in San Francisco, which was also a very tough neighborhood to, to roll out something like that, a concept like that. And we struggled. We struggled with this model. We struggled to make money. And uh, the great thing about it was this was, my, this was my second partnership. I'm on my fifth partnership now. Um, this was my second partnership, and this was my sixth business, my sixth food business. And we were seeking about $2 million in financing to start this concept on larger scale, and we kind of stumbled onto these guys um, who, who wanted us to come pop up uh, just for six months, and we decided this would be a good way to test out the partnership and test out our concept. And so we invested $75,000 as opposed to two million, and the partnership didn't work out and the space didn't work out, and what a great lesson learned <laughs> to do it on a smaller scale and do it slower. Um, this is actually Mayor Ed Lee of San Francisco. Um, he was a big fan of anything that was happening in mid-market. Next slide, please, Shanta. So I worked with entrepreneurs for many, many years. This is one of my dear friends, Kika. She runs a business called Kika's Treats in San Francisco. She makes chocolate-covered confections, and uh, she has an incredible caramel line. If, you ever, if you're ever into caramels, she uses coconut palm sugar, which, is, which just really gives the caramels a unique, new, unique flavor. But I was really struggling with how to support her and other entrepreneurs like her, because I think, like a lot of us know, we might be cash poor and short on time as entrepreneurs growing food businesses, and, and yet we might be really good at producing products, but, but not necessarily that great at growing businesses, so we need the help, but, but how do you work on the business and in the business at the same time, right? Those are two very distinctly different things. And at the end of the day, I couldn't figure out how to make a consultancy scale. A consultancy that supports the small and, and kind of startup growth stage food entrepreneurs. So I landed on this small little company um, in 2012 as a consultant called Airbnb. Has anyone heard of Airbnb? 
So Airbnb back then was 140 people. Okay, today they're uh, 2,500 globally. So in, what is that, four years? I, I, someone do the math. That's like 1,500x growth. I don't even know. I can't even do that. In my, but, you know, we scaled in, in insane growth rate. And Airbnb uh, approached us, Fair Resources, to build them a self-operating food program for all their employees. Um, and let me break that down a little bit. Self-operating meaning that everyone was going to be employed by Airbnb, all culinary staff, okay, which is very unique. When I worked at Google, I was a BAMCO employee. I worked for Bon Appetit Management Company, one of the largest food management company um, food companies in the world. And uh, they're actually a subsidiary of Compass Group. Compass Group is actually the holding group that is one of the largest, is the largest in, in the world. Um, but Airbnb said, we want something really unique. We want you to build us a food brand for and with our employees um, completely unique to us. And I leapt at that opportunity. Um, back then it was me and Gavin, and he and I leapt at that opportunity as, as consultants because we wanted to build something that was unique to Airbnb, um, but that was also inclusive, right? And, and integrative. And when I worked at Bon Appetit, I always felt like the help. I had a different color badge than, than the Googlers. I was only allowed into a sixth of the campus at Google. Um, we were treated like the help. And, and that is not something, if, if any of us have ever had service jobs where we perform those types of duties, that is not something that feels good. Right, so um, we were able to build something at Airbnb that was completely different than what other companies were doing. And this is actually, this is, uh, this is the dining room um, at Airbnb. These are all their core values. You can't see them very well on the back wall, but um, they, they, they illustrate a bunch of their core values, which is great. They're, they're big into storyboarding there, um, which I love. And then this is actually the only event that we ever did and this kind of speaks to what Bob was talking about in terms of marketing. It, it, it's a, uh, it was a fundraiser for an incredible incubator called La Cocina. Has anyone heard of La Cocina in San Francisco? It's a nationally known incubator, incredible mission. They're a nonprofit, and they provide um, kitchen space and technical assistance to minority, low-income female food entrepreneurs, um, which is actually a really big market. Um, in San Francisco, and they do incredible work. And I worked for them as a culinary director for a very short period of time, and, and they were looking for a space and kind of an in-kind donor to host their gala, and we helped them raise $100,000 um, just on one evening, right? And that's the kind of way that I wanted to promote our program at Airbnb. We offered up the staff, we offered up the food, we offered up the physical space, we obviously helped them with coordinating and logistics. And it, and the other amazing thing about Airbnb is it, is it taught me about this market, this market of food management. And it really helped us to make a giant pivot as a consultancy. And we, we shifted. We, we, we shifted really over the last year and a half. We've shifted to being a food management company. Um, we, still, we still do some consulting, and we're actually currently in the process of figuring out if our consultancy is going to stay and how it will um, intersect and interact with the management company. But um, after doing this work with Airbnb, and we actually worked uh, with a couple other tech companies in the Bay Area um, in New York, we, we learned that we needed to either be committed to not owning any of it, meaning the program, or we needed to own all of it. So the interesting thing about these programs as a consultant is you can, you know, and this is just actually part of the course as a consultant in general, no matter what you're doing, is you can offer up advice, but at the end of the day, the business owner can take it or leave it, right? And that's, that's tough, especially when you're so... You're so adamant about your values and wanting to, to instill values and integrity into these, these businesses. And we just, we, we realized really trial by fire, we realized that we needed to either 
own all of it or we need to not be attached to owning any of it. And oftentimes when we would leave these programs, they would throw a baby out with the bathwater the minute we left. And all of a sudden the vendor and partner relationships that we had established weren't, were no longer there. The, the, the talent trajectory and the way that we wanted to cultivate and develop our talent wasn't, any, wasn't there anymore. And we fought with ourselves about becoming a management company, a management and staffing company, because it's incredible infrastructure. But we realized that if we really wanted to make a business and do all the things that we wanted to do, this was the model to pursue. So November of last year, we got together. There were six of us at that time. We said, OK, let's make this decision and let's do it. Then we started to try and build the infrastructure. And, you know, this is just, you'll have to excuse the formatting because I switched from Keynote to PowerPoint and I'm not that tech savvy and so some of this might be a little bit off, but this just gives you kind of more of a linear idea of, of, of what we've been doing the last few years. And, you know, it's been slow growth um, and it's been pretty mindful growth, but we weren't really growing much until we started taking on these, these management uh, clients acting as food management provider. And then we really decided that we needed to explore the market. And this market is massive. Okay, the, the um, food facilities and hospitality employs billions of people in the world, billions, right? And these are not small numbers. Um, and of course, like a lot of industry these days, top four companies own 75% of the market. Right, and Shanta, can you, thanks. Um, these, are, these are some of them, and this is, this is the volume that they're doing. Um, Compass Group is the uh, organization I was telling you about earlier. They have uh, a couple of different subsidiaries, Bon Appetit being one of them. Bon Appetit is considered like the high end of management companies, and they operate globally, schools, companies, institutions all over. Um, we decided that we should compete in this market, uh, which is crazy. It's absolutely bananas. But um, it's, it's, it's put our brains onto how do we institute, instill, um, develop the types of values that we're all so passionate about on a larger scale. And this is where I get really excited because it has, it has real potential to have impact. I'm sure I don't need to tell you all, if you've ever been to a buffet line, you've seen chafing dishes, you've seen Sterno, you know these programs, they're, it's time for a facelift, right? Um, and so as we started to explore the market, we realized like actually companies want this stuff too. And we were talking to a lot of those companies and a lot of these companies were upset that there wasn't an alternative in the marketplace. They, they, they continued to get bids from the top couple companies and they weren't offering any kind of values driven programs. So we started to talk to a lot of these companies and a lot of these companies being in the San Francisco Bay Area, a lot of the companies you're talking to are in tech, which is great. What a great entry point into the market to work in a resource heavy industry like tech that also is all about innovation, right? Um, and before the next bubble burst, which could happen any day, maybe in a year or two, we, we decided that we were gonna penetrate the market through tech. So we started to talk to dozens of companies, right? Um, mainly through them reaching out to us via referrals. And the Airbnb food program has gotten a lot of um, pre press and, and, and marketing just from their employees. You know, if you look at Glassdoor, Glassdoor is a, is a really interesting website that talks all about um, different companies and, and you can submit salaries and you can submit um, values and, and ideas around how you feel about the CEO of all these different companies and you actually go onto Glassdoor and learn about um, how employees th perceive the companies that they work at. And so we started to carve a little niche and we started to carve our market and we realized that we actually 
could come in at a lower barrier of entry. We can come in and, and kind of meet the demand for a smaller type of company. And we can come in and we can produce snacks, we can, we can do catered meals, or our real sweet spot is designing kitchens and then operating them, staffing them, operating them. Um, and we're starting to do that now. Uh, it's, you know, it's a little bit more of a long-term play, but it's, it's great because we get to design the infrastructure and it's another element um, that was ripe for innovation. It, you know, oftentimes when people are designing kitchens, they're thinking about one use, or they're thinking about cooking food, or they're thinking about, you know, just getting the bare bones essentials done in a kitchen. Well, kitchens are incredible vehicles for change. And, and I'm not talking just about like production, I'm talking about education, engagement, um, multi-functioning spaces you can do so many different things in the kitchen, right? But um, oftentimes, especially within these tech companies, they're, they're designing the kitchens, building them out, and then they're programming them, which, is, which, is, which I guess is pretty typical, but it's, it's kind of a backwards way. You want to you figure out which, what the program is going to be when it grows up, and then you want to design the space around it. Stale generic programs, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I've already talked about this. So here we are. Whole new identity, whole new brand, whole new um, trajectory, but very similar values. Vermont values, chef driven, you know. Um, but as we started to look at it, we realized, okay, if we're gonna do this, like we're gonna do this. And we gotta think about scale. And as we're thinking about scale, the thing that I always come back to is, how are we going to continue to live these values? Um, and this is just a quick timeline. I actually pulled a lot of this from our pitch deck, because <laughs> we're in the process of raising our first round of funding. Um, so this is, this is a slide showing just kind of the, the trajectory for the year. And then you got to actually figure out how you can take all those values and apply them to practical application. And that's where operations starts to become really interesting. Because you can say that you can do all these things, but if you can't actually pull them off, then you're just greenwashing, right? And that's my biggest fear within this company is that we're going to say that we can do all these things and then we can't actually pull them off. I know we can pull them off because we did it at Airbnb, but we were spending other people's money, which is great. And we're still gonna spend other people's money because we've decided on a model that's a pass-through cost, right? So, that, so our model is actually cost plus, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. But we wanted to make sure that we continued to build based on values. So we've identified three pillars of our, of our company and how we program and how we operate that essentially design food and people. Again, you gotta, you, gotta program, you gotta program it well. So we take a collaborative approach, which is very, very different than the management companies. Management companies are, are pretty cookie cutter. They're gonna go in, they're gonna say, this is the program, this is what we do, and there's a lot of efficiencies of scale there, but we've learned that companies, not just tech companies, we're now at um, a high school as well. These, these institutions want something different. They want something unique to their culture, and understandably so, because Every place is different. So we needed to do some of these things. We needed to start to do some of these things at these companies, and we needed to do it starting with collaborating with the stakeholders, right? And really defining how we're doing this day one, even in the sales process, is key to our success. Again, a lot of words. But... These are words that tech companies love to hear in the beginning. And then of course, the minute you sign on the dotted line, it's all about data. And so one of the things that we're, that we're, that we're in the throes of right now is trying to um, garner uh, health and wellness metrics around our programs, right? So we say, okay, we're gonna source locally. Okay, well, what does local mean? Do you care about locally? sourced food. Well, some companies do, some companies don't, but we do. So we're always going to track it. 
And at some point you might care and you can have that data, but we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that we're tracking it and, and we're gonna define it for you as well. So local for us right now is 200 miles from wherever our kitchen is or from, from wherever our program is. And you know we've taken a lot of cues from our competitors. Bon Appetit says 20% local. And you know, especially in California, 20% local is nothing. I mean, you can do 60% local without batting your eyes. You can do 60% local mainly just in produce and, and meat, right? And so we're starting to establish some of these, some of these um, metrics to say, hey, company X, you should care about this stuff. If you don't, we understand we're gonna care about this stuff. But then what do you care about? Do you care about BMI of your employees? Do you care about productivity? Do you care about, um, we just had a, a leading international consulting firm say that they care about collisions, which I think is a terrible word for creating you know, um, connection and, and community. But that's, that's, that's what they were referring to. They wanted to, they wanted to establish more collision experiences. And so they asked us if we could track that metric. And we're thinking to ourselves like, sure, we would love to try and track that metric. We have no idea how, but let's figure it out together. Right? And they love that. That's such a value add. That's such a sell selling point. Uh, this, this just speaks to architecture and, and branding, and I think it's great. Um, I got a lot of this slide cut off, which is fine. This is, this is speaking to food values, and you know, for us, a lot of this stuff is, is second nature. Um, we want to ensure that we're really, really low on the food chain. We want to ensure that we're mitigating waste. Right? One of the biggest things that we can do in our kitchens is value added processing. Bob was speaking to that. Um, you, can, you can create a lot out of very little if you're doing it well and you know what you're doing. So, you know, uh, pickling kale and collard stems or using, using, you know, before you juice the lemon, like zest it. Simple little uh, means and methods, whole animal butchery is another one of those things where we, we've started to roll it out at some of our programs, a tough thing to scale, because essentially if you, if you buy two steer in a week and you're trying to feed 1,500 people, but you're trying to cook the same menu for each service, you need to figure out the four different cuts on that, on that steer that can translate to the same cooking method. But again, what an awesome operational problem to try and solve for. Right? And, and what a great way to reduce waste, add value, and keep your, keep your budget uh, on, on par. Um, 60%, yeah, huh, okay. Well, there's some great standards down there about what we do with our food and what we call it out, and what we call out, but um, sourcing 100% organic produce, absolutely. You know, what people don't understand in the non-organic world is that if you're buying in season, these days in 2016, conventional and organics are pretty close, especially if you're buying local and you have these good relationships with farms and they're willing to give you a break. We're actually starting to explore um, CSA programs on a larger scale with a lot of these farms too. So we have, we have substantial budgets to a lot of these programs. What if we buy in four seasons ahead and you can actually plant 20 acres for us and give us a little bit of a break knowing that we're going to purchase that stuff from you over the next few seasons. This is, uh, <laughs> this is, this is a, an org chart that we developed like three months ago and it's completely out of date, but this is, this is speaking to our growth, some of our growth and the types of people that we need to hire. Some of these people are already in place, some of them are not. And you look at some of these programs that we're going to be developing, you know, 10, 15, 20 people that we're hiring, that we're training, that are employees of Fair Resources that are gonna be working at the Etsy's, the, the Airbnbs of the world, and getting to teach all of those employees, educate all of those employees about locally sourced food, value added processing, um, you know, health and wellness. And for us, really, people are at the core. Again, back to relationships. It's all about relationships. And um, how many of you have ever worked in a commercial kitchen before? Wow, that's a lot. That's like 60% of the room. So um, how many of you have ever loved working in a commercial kitchen before? One person. Two. 
Right. So um, I grew up in, in kitchens, and they have traditionally been um, places of long hours, grueling labor, um, poor working conditions. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on. I could fill an hour and a half just with that, converse, that, that topic. But we, we are realizing that we really have this ability to look at the culinary landscape completely differently and actually start to really value these people and, 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 and educate and, and share and, and learn and grow together, right? So we're trying to figure out all the different ways that culinary professionals actually want to be engaged and want to learn. And it's pretty much comes down, I mean, we've been talking to people for seven, eight years about this stuff and it pretty, comes, pretty much comes down to two things, stability and security and growth and trajectory. So we are, we are building a model that, that does both those things, right? And we're giving, we're giving stock. We just went through this incredible um, process of rolling out stock to all of our employees, and we'll continue to scale that. We're doing 401k matching. We are providing full health benefits uh, and nine to five uh, hours with a lot of these, which is unheard of in the culinary profession in a lot of ways. And we're actually asking these people what they care about. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to learn? What are you proficient in? What do you, what do you have passion about? And those two pretty simple acts, although they're, you know, there's a lot of layers, are profound for a lot of people. And this is where this whole model deeply resonates with me, is when you know, a dishwasher, Dante, will come up to me and say, hey, I'm not addicted to Diet Coke anymore. Now I want to drink seltzer water or kombucha. Or, uh, you know, I had, I had a man tell me recently that his wife thinks that he's lame because he wants to eat vegetables at every meal. And that was like one of the most heartwarming things I've ever heard in my life. Um, and the way that we're selling this to, to the company is by saying, we're actually going to develop employees that are, that are on par with the way you're developing your employees. And these are going to be happy, healthy culinary employees. And they're going to be able to transcend that into the program. And there's this big distinction in, in the world of culinary between service and hospitality, which is something I don't think we talk enough about. And it's definitely something that I felt when I worked at, at Google is I was a service provider, right? I wasn't part of the team. I wasn't part of the family. And so this distinction between service and hospitality is incredible, incredibly important to us and, and vital for us to be able to communicate to the client. This, this is also a slide that we developed probably six months ago and is a little out of date, but it was when we were in that brainstorming phase of like, what are all the great things we can do as a company, right? So I think we threw this together for, for some odd reason. I don't know if it was a client pitch or if it was our pitch deck. And then, and then the next week we were like, oh, we better, we better make all that stuff happen now. So now we get to go back into the operational side of things and we get to figure out how to translate this into... Um, practical application. And I'm just going to share with you a little on, in, 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 the, um, in the interest of full transparency about our revenue model, right? So one of the things that we're doing with the client and with our company is open book financials. So we actually build the financial budget, the operational budget from day one with the client, which is also pretty unheard of in this, in this uh, space. And it's amazing how many people actually um, want to know about this stuff but don't care. It's like as soon as you open the books, that's all they care about. They don't actually need to see the bottom line. They just want to know that you're open to opening the books. This is, this is where I get really, really excited because I think that we have the potential to really shift the paradigm of institutional food. And I think the way that we're going about it is we're looking at it um, using a resource heavy sector like tech to test out the model. And we've, we've been running these numbers now for four years. We can, we can spend anywhere between 25 and $32 per day per person, food and labor for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, drink, catering, operational costs. And when you think about that, and remember, like impeccably sourced food, 
you know, paying your people well, treating them the way that most people want to be treated in careers these days, this, this number is, is incredibly powerful. Because if you can start to whittle that down and you can get maybe closer to 23, 25, once you reach efficiencies of scale at a program and, you're, and you're, you're mitigating all your waste and you're buying in bulk and you're sending back your packaging and it's like every piece of all the values that we know that we need to do, we're doing, we can drive this price down substantially and that's when we wanna get into healthcare and elder care and schools and, and institutions that have marginalized this price point and said, no, we can only do it for this amount. Well, we feel like we can prove that you can do it for that amount and still do it well. We just need to work out the model a little bit longer. Program reporting, something that we do really regularly with our clients, again, to be in a collaborative process. Is there anything important on here? Not really. Okay. This is a reporting slide, doesn't that look? Doesn't that look nice? We hired Airbnb's presentation designer to design our, our keynotes in the hopes that uh, clients would like them. So, so this is our model, and, and this is some of the ideas for the future, too. I mean, I've talked about a lot of this stuff. Um, I, think, I think all this is very achievable, and I think that institutional food is very ripe and ready for some change. And... It happened with a major pivot <laughs> within our business model, seeing that um, we were having a tough time scaling, there was a market need, we made this pivot, and maybe next year I'll let you know how it's going. Thanks. So we have time for two questions. So um, as you're, as you're, as you said, looking looking at the the investment and you know starting starting to try to scale this, um, what approaches are you taking to make sure that you know the, the the VC values don't end up transcending your own goals in this project? Going to hear Alan Newman speak, listening to <laughs> listening to mentors. I I mean I think the 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 great thing again about VCs and being in in San Francisco is it's still about relationships. So if we find the right VCs, then hopefully those values won't fall by the wayside. We also are very adamant about this eventually being an ESOP, and that is another really important piece for us of like knowing what we want to be when we grew up, because we haven't known that. I've never known that in the eight businesses that I've started. This is actually the first one where, I, where it has legs, and I've said, this is what I want it to eventually be. I don't want to sell to a Bon Appetit. I don't want an IPO. I actually want us to be able to sell to our employees. So, so just setting that bar with angels and VCs has been um, really important. As you're developing your business, are you doing some of the marketing, the outreach to the people who come and, I guess, buy or acquire the food? Yeah, you know, the programs are the best market tools. So, you know, most of our businesses actually come from people who are t touring Airbnb. I mean, other tech companies are always wanting to, to tour these offices that are, you know, named the Forbes top 10 offices in the country or whatever. So a lot of these um, people are going and touring Airbnb's kitchen and, and program and saying, hey, we want to, you know, we're curious about this. We want to know how, how you develop this and they'll often refer us to them. I mean, marketing is also something that we have not done well and something that we're just starting to do now um, and really look for those sweet spot clients. Um, but the programs are the best ways to actually sell. Thank you all.